Hello everyone and welcome to Autism Stories, where we connect you with amazing people who are helping autistic adults and teens become more successful. I'm your host, Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Through the coaching of Autism Personal Coach, we have often met people with autistic and non-binary identities, and it has been increasingly important through the last few years to support people with these dual identities. On this episode of Autism Stories, we do just that by having a discussion about gender identity with the fantastic Alex Earhart. If you would like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate if you could give us a positive rating and review as it will help others to learn about autism stories. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Alex, thanks for returning to Autism Stories. Thank you so much for having me. Last time we talked, uh, we, we discussed you becoming more comfortable with who you are and who, are, who you are meant to be as an autistic person. I know since then you have only continued further down this path as you're embracing something that you fought for some time now, which is your gender identity. How long has it been since you initially started to question this identity? It's a really good question and um, one that's a little bit hard to pin down, but I think for really as long as I can remember, there's been like something off and you know part of that is being autistic and not knowing but then another part is this huge identity component where I never felt really like I belonged as as a woman or a girl and just felt this huge amount of discomfort with quote-unquote girly things Um, of course people who are not girls can wear makeup and hair and love outfits and everything but the people around me who identified as women were so into those things, especially my peers, and I never had any sort of interest. It was more wanting to belong that I showed some sort of interest in those things, but really never was interested. Um, And of course, that's just presentation and interest. I also remember always feeling a lot more comfortable with boys my age in elementary and um, pretty late into elementary school. And then middle school that social divide happened of like well you can't hang out with boys because you're a girl and that was like a huge I think that was like one of the biggest moments of like shock to me where it was acknowledged like you can't do that you are a girl and something in me was like Ugh, what which of course there's there's a lot to that 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 I won't go into and unpack but I think that's really middle school is when I started to feel tremendously uncomfortable especially with puberty and everything and then high school a little bit more uh, realizing that I was bisexual and that took up a lot more of my energy Um, and that's when my chronic health issues started up really badly Um, and then college and then my job in Japan where I met um, non-binary and trans people and became close with those people for the first time really Um, was when it really started to become apparent and I and I found the words I think I've always known something but I didn't have the words to describe that something and something that is always important what are your pronouns increasingly they them feels very comfortable to me I'm I'm still okay with she her um one because I I don't feel like fighting and correcting people when my name change is the thing that I really want to fight for. Being called Sarah is now becoming more uncomfortable. Um, not necessarily painful, but just jarring. Um, she, her is not necessarily painful. It's It almost makes me laugh because it feels like, who, who are they talking to? It, oh, oh, me. Uh, oh, uh. <laughs> so it doesn't feel painful. It just feels weird. <laughs> Now, when I've talked with many non-binary people, and one of the things that has struck me is that so much of the world 
doesn't understand or isn't even aware of the definition of non-binary. So what does being a non-binary person mean to you? Well, it's interesting. I know more and more non-binary people um, as I learn more about the community and meet more autistic people and generally read more about being non-binary and being trans. Um, and everybody kind of has their own identity surrounding that, and um, which is wonderful. For me personally, I'm very fluid in my gender, and sometimes I do feel kind of sort of like a girl, maybe like a tomboy, quote-unquote, but other times I do not at all feel like woman fits me, and it's just really uncomfortable. Sometimes I feel um, both male and female. Sometimes I feel neither. Um, so I don't think that my identity and what I feel inside fits on this straight line and one side is female and the other side is male it I I am somewhere off off of the chart in a little corner um, perhaps a little bit toward the masculine side but not on that line I read uh, not that long ago where you stated that a huge part of your journey was realizing how much you identified with a variety of media as a teenager and as a as a child. Um, I always I always love talking about TV and, uh, and and movie characters. So, what were some of the characters you identified with? Oh yeah, it was really funny when I I think it was a few years ago. I was laying in bed trying to fall asleep, and I realized one or two of these characters and then I realized another and then the next day I realized another and was like oh my god I might not have had the words but um one would be a huge uh icon for a lot of trans people Mulan from Disney the song Reflection really always resonated so deeply with me you know never passing as a perfect bride or a perfect daughter uh can it be I'm not meant to play this part but looking in the mirror and not recognizing that person. It always resonated me, with me, and um, I, it wasn't until realizing my gender identity and looking back that I'm like, wow, wow, that's deep. And that's for a lot of trans people I've seen um, identify in that way. Uh, another would be Ranma Half. Uh, it's a comic book manga from Japan where the character is cursed, and when they're splashed with hot water, they change to one sex, and then they're splashed with cold water, they change to another. Um, and I remember being, like, envious of that. <laughs> uh, another big one would be Sailor Uranus uh, from Sailor Moon. And in the comic book, at least, she's described as being both male and female, strengths of both genders, and, I don't know, obviously both genders as a non-binary people <laughs> doesn't sit with me well, but... It's a pretty old manga, and I always thought she was amazing. American book, uh, Tamara Pierce's Song of the Lioness. This is a little different, but um, she, the main character in that book, wants to become a knight, and only boys can do that. So she cuts off her hair, and she uh, puts on the male knight attire, and she becomes a knight that way. Um, and then uh, even like the Takarazuka Review in Japan is a professional elite Japanese performance review. And the actors play all the roles, regardless of gender. Um, and that I remember seeing um, when I studied abroad and just was blown away. Like, you can do that? Oh. <laughs> now... I've heard a lot of people uh, talk about how, that have talked about gender identity, also talk about gender dysphoria. So I'm wondering for you, how much of that influenced you to accept or not accept your identity as a non-binary person? Well, obviously, trigger warning for gender dysphoria, but also um, eating disorders and uh, weight gain, things like that. So I, I definitely experienced a lot of dysphoria surrounding, I mean, ever since puberty, surrounding my weight, and it affected me 
subconsciously by developing a pretty severe eating disorder. And it it's a painful thing to feel like you're put into this little box because of how your body looks or how you present when inside that's not at all what you're feeling or who you are. And I was getting really sick of being pushed back into that box. Um, I think a huge thing was living in Japan um, for several years. I was teaching there and a lot of people in the countryside that I lived in, especially the men, would try to force me into this box of feminine roles and just really accentuate on the fact that this was my role as a woman. And um, I don't know, I, I mean, I had a lot of great friends of all genders there as well who did not do that, but the ones that did, it just increasingly felt really uncomfortable. Um, and that was where I, I met some of my friends who are trans and non-binary and wore the clothes that they wanted to and taught me about binders and everything. And, and so I think Japan was a catalyst in that heightened gender dysphoria that made me go, I can't do this. I need to address this somehow. And so then it's been a few years of internally addressing that and with my uh, husband as well. To me, you're an inspiration to others because you've now made the decision to say, this is who I am, this is my authentic self, and I'm going to embrace being a non-binary person. So I know you've disclosed this on your blog, and I'm just curious, what has been the feedback to this disclosure? Yeah, um, well, thank you. <laughs> um, I, I feel like rather than like bravery or inspiration with with anything that I share with my blog and being autistic, being one of those things, it's just getting to a point where I'm suffering to hold something in and I just cannot help myself, you know, for better or for worse, I internalize it for a long time, think it through, talk with my therapist, and then eventually just have to sort of throw it out for everyone to be like, oh, 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 where'd this come from? <laughs> So, sorry, mom and dad. Um, so I would say overall, though, people have been very, very supportive. Um, I got a lot of comments on that piece saying, this is great, Alex, and thanks so much for sharing this, Alex. And like that intentional use of the name to show that, that people support me was wonderful. And uh, I even had a few people write to me and say, thank you for, for posting this because my my child is expressing some of these things and now I can better help them or I've been wondering about myself and this has given me courage and that's been really phenomenal. So thinking about disclosure, what has the process been like, like for you? Did you disclose your non-binary identity first on your blog or were there other people or places you disclosed to first? I would say it's been a few years of kind of testing the waters. My husband knew pretty much right away because that was the time when I was really, um, we were we were both in Japan and that's that period of time where I was in that mode of self-exploration and trying to understand who I really am. I've mentioned it to uh, my father especially for a number of years and then uh, a few of my friends know to some extent, but not a whole lot of people. I, I, I didn't feel comfortable enough yet in the term trans or non-binary or anything like uh, in the sense that I wanted to be really super sure before telling people. Um, so I disclosed to my parents that I wanted to change my name. And then pretty much immediately threw the blog posts out into the, <laughs> into the world. And it's it's been incredible. I have gone to several friend gatherings since that blog post, obviously before uh, self-isolation. Um, and it was just flawless. I actually haven't really had many people use Sarah. It's been pretty incredible how seam seamlessly people have used Alex. Um 
my family has come up with a really good way to work on using Alex. Um, they're trying really hard. It's just um, they've called me Sarah for 30 years, and so they don't even realize when they're saying it. So they've asked me to start saying after they've said Sarah just to say Alex, and they'll say Oh, 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 right. Oh, I didn't even realize I was saying it. Um, so that's been a huge tool, actually. They are really supportive and, and helpful in that process. Um, and I also, pretty soon after the blog post, I came out at work and asked that I change to Alex. And I can't even describe how incredible they have been. They have been fabulous they got me a new email um changed everything on the site changed everything um on applications that i that i handle and just asked questions and tried to make me feel comfortable and um a few of them are working really hard on they them pronouns even which is like extra credit in my in my book <laughs> I'm wondering about uh, you, the choice of using the name Alex. How did you go about choosing uh, this name, and what have been your internal thoughts and feelings uh, when people identify you by this name? It's kind of a secret, but I've always really envied the name Alex, um, the way it sounds, the way it looks on paper, and especially always envied um, assigned female as birth people who have Alex as their name and just gender, gender neutral names in general, I've always really envied, um, and thought we're, we're cool and, you know, surprise, that's why. Um, <laughs> but to me, um, I think Alex means like strength and I believe it means defender or protector, which is pretty cool. And then I chose a middle name, too. Um, I think I'm going to use Nico, uh, but spelled with a K. Since I'm fluent in Japanese, Nico can mean smile, um, and Nico can mean sunshine or daylight. Um, so, um, And I know that uh, Nico also means victory of the people, uh, which, I don't know, I just think it's cool. Uh, protector, victory of the people, smile, sunshine, these are all things that make me feel good. Um, and when people call me Alex, it, it's, it feels like love because they are consciously making an effort to show me you matter. I believe you, you are valid. Your identity is valid. And I see you and I love you. Um, and so it just, it's the best feeling and, and it's the same feeling as when someone says, Sarah, oh, sorry, Alex, I don't care. You made a mistake. Brains are hard to reprogram. The fact that they made that effort to change it and aren't saying, no, no, your, your name is Sarah. You know, it, it's still an act of love, I think. Earlier, you briefly mentioned about... Um the name change. So is that something you are pursuing now or possibly in the future? Yes, I definitely would like to um, change it as soon as possible. I think the, the more I have experience being called Alex, um, the more seeing it on paper feels really weird. Um, or if someone calls me from a company and says, may I speak to Sarah, I have to, to say, Oh, yeah, that's also me, I guess. Um, how can I help you? <laughs> like, it just, it's just a little jarring going back and forth. And Alex and Nico both feel so very me. Um, so I'd like to make that permanent. And uh, the whole process feels a little daunting, but I was able to access a free legal clinic. And the lawyer that I spoke with was phenomenal in breaking down the steps and giving me tips and saying you do or don't have to do that part. Um, and they even gave me some info about financial assistance from some of the local organizations to um, help with the pretty expensive uh, fees that are uh, 
a bummer to a lot of people and inaccessible to a lot of people, to be honest. Mm. So, yeah. So it sounds like help is definitely out there um, to make this process a reality. Absolutely. I wish I had known that sooner because it's been, um, Alex has been in the back of my head for, for a long, long time, many years. And, uh, but anytime I tried to look into it, it was like, Oh, this state and this County and this court and what, and and there's this rule or not this rule and how much money and being able to go to someone who's done this for tons of people and can say, first step is this, do that first step is, amazing. Now, we all have lots of different identities, but since this is Autism Stories, I, I wanted to talk about the connection for you between two of your identities, being autistic and being non-binary. How do you see one identity affecting the other? Yeah, I think that's a really good question, and certainly there are a ton of trans and non-binary um, and agender, and all sorts of us, um, autistics out there, and I think that some of it comes with there being these societal things that we either just don't get, or don't get intuitively, or don't want to do, and that gives us a lot of freedom in some ways to explore who we actually are, and say, you know what? society, this is not working for me. I'm going to do it my own way. Um, so I think that that's a big part of it, that connection of, you know, doing your own thing, um, for better, or for worse. And I think that also, at least for me, my brain has a lot of different facets and ways of looking at things. And that's, made me a very introspective person and I'm constantly thinking and looking at my identity and working through things and then circling back and looking at them again. Um, and I'm also a huge research fan. I love to look things up and read more about them and learn more and get answers. And, um, and I think that that's part of my hyper-focus mode as well and my ability to stay on a task and really delve deep into it. So I think all of those things are both, I don't know, me being autistic, but also lend themselves to me discovering that I am autistic and, uh, and as well as non-binary. So before I let you go, I, I think we need to plug your blog. Um, you recently had a, a post I really enjoyed. I didn't. I didn't uh, bug you and tell you how much I enjoyed it. But the the the, the one about thoughts from a quarantine autistic was was really great. So oh, thank you. So maybe tell people a little bit about that and how they can go about uh, finding your blog. Absolutely. Um, well, thank you for reading it. I'm glad you liked it. So my blog is now called Autistically Alex, and. It's just autisticallyalex.com, and I um, have been really enjoying having my name because, you know, the old one was Seeking Sarah, um, but any link will still go to autisticallyalex.com, so fret not. Um, so thoughts for my quarantined autistic. I haven't written in a while. Uh, my last post had been about uh, Seeking Sarah and Finding Alex, um, but this one, sometimes a piece will just kind of make itself in the back of my head, even if I'm telling it not to. And then it will just kind of claw at the sides of my brain until I make it happen. And this was one of those pieces. I felt such a need to reach out to people that are struggling. Um, I, I especially worry about actually people who have never experienced mental illness or chronic illness or isolation because those of us that have experience with those things on one hand this is not helping and it's exacerbating some things that that some of us have not experienced in quite a while um but people who have never experienced it what coping skills do they have what strategies do they have to deal with something like this they may not and that 
kind of scared me. <laughs> so I decided to make this piece um, with a few tips um, regarding how can how you can approach a situation like this where you're overwhelmed and you're scared and you're uncertain and you don't know what to do. Um, so I, I broke down five things. Um, this one was to keep routine, any routine that you can, and uh, adapt what you have to change. So, for example, getting up at the same time that you normally would. Um, if you can't, say, go to the gym, going outside on your porch and doing an exercise, going in front of the TV and putting on a YouTube um, routine to follow at the same time that you normally would. Um, anything to get that sense of calm and familiarity and routine. And even subconsciously, I think that that helps me a lot. Number two was to put locks on my social media apps and limit the news that I take in. Um, and a lot of this comes down to, I have all this information, but what am I going to do with it? I'm, I, it, I do no good. I actually stress out my body and make me less resistant to fighting off mental health issues and any illness if I'm just constantly stressed out and my heart rate's going and I'm freaking out over stuff. So I put uh, locks on my social media to remind me how long I've been on there and I can um, executive function wise, like switch out of just obsessing over social media. And I've really been careful about how often I access news. That's helped a ton with my huge levels of anxiety over the last few weeks. Um, and then third, uh, dual tasking, which is um, something that my music therapist stresses a lot. Um, if I do just one thing to relax, I will almost always end up dissociating or doing something like checking the news when I don't want to be. It's just the way my ADD and autistic brain works. Um, and one thing that I found to combat that is doing two things that are relaxing at the same time. Um, I've been huge into cross-stitching lately, so I will cross-stitch and listen to a children's audiobook. Um, I will listen to music and play a game, color and sing along to music. It has to be two things to really stop my brain from spiraling, I found, or distracting. Um, and then fourth uh, was just being gentle with myself about mental health and like I said earlier, I think that a lot of people potentially are experiencing mental health struggles for the first time or struggles that they have, for the most part, learned how to manage and are doing pretty good usually. And this has really thrown a huge wrench into that. Um, and then, of course, there's people who are struggling day to day, and, and this is just a whole new realm of struggle. So I, I think all of us need to be incredibly kind to ourselves and to others and give ourselves a break. You don't have to learn how to speak Spanish in quarantine. You can be chill, color, take care of your basic, basic needs. I'm talking shower, eat, use the bathroom, sleep. And that is good enough. Um, number five was to have some sort of positive output. That's um, been a huge game changer for me. And uh, the way I chose to do this um, was my husband and I made a cover video, I guess you could call it. Um, he made an arrangement for the piano and I sang and uh, we did uh, Tomorrow from Annie. And we put it out on uh, my personal social media just to all of our friends and family to say, the sun will come back out. This is not permanent. Yes, things are changing. They might not ever be the same, but we are here with you. And things will go back to a sense of okayness again someday. It's not going to be the same okay, but the sun is going to come out and um, and I think people can choose to have positive output in any way that they want. You can write an email um, to someone like your, your grandma who is alone. You can write her an email or give her a call, um, talk about happy things, support her. You can 
um, do a grocery run for someone who needs it. You can, it doesn't have to be anything huge and you're still making a huge change um, in someone's life. And I think that's huge for not only your mental health, but the mental health of those who are benefiting from it. Absolutely. Well, Alex, uh, thanks for returning to Autism Stories again. I always enjoy our conversations. I do too. Thank you so much. And thank you for amplifying autistics and LGBTQ people, non-binary people. It's a huge, huge thing, and I really thank you for it. Thank you for listening to today's episode, and thank you so much to Alex, as I always enjoy and learn something from our conversations. Modern life is challenging for just about anyone right now. However, when you're autistic, the world isn't designed with your unique traits in mind, and everyday demands can feel insurmountable. At Autism Personal Coach, we celebrate neurodiversity by empowering adults and teens to be the best version of their authentic selves. The people we serve are the real experts. We're here to make your goals a reality. On next week's episode of Autism Stories, we will talk with Rob Senderhoff about coaching the first openly autistic person to play Division I college basketball. Talk to you then.